Today I'm joined by Kerry Brown. He's a professor of Chinese studies and the director of the Lao China Institute at King's College London. He's an associate fellow of the Asia Pacific program at Chatham House. Uh, and today we're going to be discussing uh, Kerry's many books on China. Um, I've recently read this one, your new one. Um, and you say trying to understand China without having at least some knowledge of this historical background is nevertheless impossible. So why is it, imp why is it, why is it important that we understand China's history and what does it tell us about modern China today? Mm. I mean, one reason why it's you know, important to understand history is because Chinese people obviously think it's important. I, I mean, when you go around China, when you talk to Chinese people, um, you know, they have, I think they have a strong sense of their history and the history that goes really way back into you know the kind of pre-christian era um some of them say five thousand years a continuous kind of civilized history and this is sometimes you know questioned whether <laughs> there was sort of five thousand years but certainly um it's a long and complex and you know very varied history um and i think without really understanding that it's, it's hard to make sense of the complexities of china today you know, in one way, it's a very, very new country and, you know, kind of being created as the People's Republic in 1949. But in another way, it's a very ancient country where, you know, archaeologists are digging up things that were deposited three, four thousand years ago. And so, you know, that kind of ambiguity between old and new is something you see all the time all over China. And I think it's sort of important for people who want to really engage with the country to try and sort of work out what the relationship between the past and the present is. Um, and I can't really see how you can understand many aspects of the present without knowing something about where they come from and, you know, the context. So I think history in this particular case really matters. It matters in many places, but, you know, in this case, I think it, it really, really matters. Can you tell us a bit more about China's march to modernity and the competing visions that shape that? So Sun Yat-sen and Mao Zedong. Yeah, I mean, China's initial, um, I suppose, engagement or interaction with the uh, developed world or the industrialized world uh, in the 19th century was not a happy one. You know, it was a very kind of dramatic and traumatic experience. I think that the first Opium War in 1839 to 1841 uh, led to a very big crisis of confidence and China basically feeling like it had been sort of, uh, you know, defeated uh, as much by itself as by others. It didn't have the industrial infrastructure. It didn't have the kind of boats that had defeated it by the British. Um, it didn't have the kind of weaponry. And I think this created a sort of long period of soul searching and in the 20th century this was compounded by all the political changes particularly in Russia with the rise of communism there from 1917 and you know the desire in China really to both catch up but also in some areas to try and overtake the world around it uh, that's all been obviously impacted by the second world war uh, very very big uh, kind of psychological and physical impact on China uh, from 1937 and kind of probably even more profound or as profound as the impact of the war in Europe. China was actually an ally under the nationalist government with um, the European, uh, the, with, with the uh, British and Americans. Um, and, and so, you know, the fact that it then entered into the period of the Cold War from 19. Well, I mean, from 1950s, the 1950s, although the People's Republic was established in 1949, I think, you know, all of these have created a, a sort of very hybrid modernity for China, where on the one hand, it's been seeking the um, technological and industrial sort of m things that have largely come from Europe and America. But it's also taken this, you know, marxist leninist system from well, originally Europe, but then via U the USSR, but made it very, very indigenous, very localized. So, I mean, that's a paradox. It's a very strange thing that China has copied these two things, you know, capitalism with China, with European characteristics and uh, also, <clears throat> uh, you know, Marxism uh, 
with from Europe, but made them highly kind of indigenous and unique and, and different. Uh, and that I think is the secret in some ways, how it's managed to take these things and yet make them its own. So um, what occurred under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping and Hu Jintao later on? Well, I mean, the um, Mao Zedong era from 49 to 76 uh, had a very distinctive sort of um, shape. Uh, class struggle, so very divisive in society. Um, very utopian ideals, you know, the social ideals of, of being able to create almost like a perfect society. Um, quite isolated, you know, the Cold War was at its height. So Deng Xiaoping, in a sense, created a, a more pragmatic uh, approach after Mao's death. I mean, Deng had been one of the key assistants and allies of Mao Zedong while he was alive. Uh, and so, in some ways, they are similar. You know, they shared the well, I guess two things. One is a strong sense of the critical role of the Communist Party uh, and its sort of function to unify and carry society forward. Uh, but secondly, <clears throat> a very strong sense of nationalism. And I think that nationalism has probably become much stronger since the you know, late 1970s. So Deng Xiaoping's leadership, I mean, not just him as a person, but people around him, um, in quite complicated and varied ways from 1978 onwards, uh, started to embrace some of the kind of tactics and ideas from capitalism. Uh, but they, they did make sure that, you know, the kind of privileged and prime role of the Communist Party was never given up. And leaders since then have sort of worked in that framework. You know, there's been many changes socially, legally, you know, China now uh, as a society and as a, as a sort of cultural sort of entity is very different. However, the commitment has always been very much to ensuring the, the kind of role of the Communist Party at the heart of all of this. That has changed, has changed the same. Everything else has changed, but that has stayed the same. And under Hu Jintao, uh, the leader before, the current leader, Xi Jinping, so I think from 2002 to 2012, uh, what, what there really was was a continuation of that framework. But this extraordinary phenomena of China becoming an economic you know, giant, uh, really since entry to the World Trade Organization in 2001, China's economy has just exploded, um, quadrupled in a decade between 2001 and 2012. So if you say Hu Jintao, you're basically saying economic growth. Now we're in a more complex era where China's growth is not as huge. It's still good. Well, I mean, even with COVID-19, it's still um, managing to grow, uh, which, which is quite remarkable. But it's really more about China creating a sort of um, modernity on its own, own terms where it maintains its very unique political system, but is a global power. So this is a totally new situation and one that we are all wrestling with at the moment. So can you tell us a bit more about Xi Jinping? What's his story? Where does he come from? And how does he rise to power? Yeah, I mean, Xi Jinping, the current, you know, kind of president, uh, head of the Communist Party, head of the military. I mean, he seems to have all the power levers. Um, was born in the early 1950s, I think 1952, um, and was the son of a previous elite leader, um, a man called Xi Jong-sun, um, who, who himself was put under house arrest from the early 1960s because he, I think he was a vice premier and a, a vice a kind of minister for culture. Um, and so, you know, kind of Xi Jinping has a, fairly complex background where on the one hand he's a member of the elite and on the other he also suffered uh, because of the you know Maoist um, repression um, so from 19 I think 1969 she went down to um, Xianxi which is a sort of revolutionary area Yan'an in Xianxi um, to live in a cave I mean that's that's the sort of the account that's given um, and was rusticated sort of living almost like a kind of peasant and he often, well, he and the propagandists in Beijing often refer to this part of his story. 
So the idea is, you know, he's almost like a peasant emperor, a bit like Mao, you know, he's sort of like a man of the um, soil, but also a man of the elite. Um, and then I think from the 1970s onwards, uh, he underwent a sort of political, um, you know, kind of career. Uh, he tried, I think, 10 times to join the Communist Party from 1973 to 74. So ironically, <laughs> uh, he wasn't initially successful. Um, and then uh, his initial career was as a military uh, kind of private secretary in a, a military uh, organization, a, a Gung Biao, a, a, a kind of major politician. Um, Xi Jinping was his assistant. Uh, but from 1982, he entered the civilian administration and uniquely worked his way up uh, all the levels of government. China has five levels of government from, um, I think from township up to central government. Xi Jinping has pretty uniquely worked in all of them and so he has pretty wide experience. Um, the kind of leader he's become is for some people very surprising because you know China seems to be on the road to becoming a capitalist, varied, you know, service-led middle-class economy and yet you've got this fairly autocratic, centralizing leader who, who often looks like he's from another era. But I mean, I think Xi Jinping's achievement, I suppose, is that he speaks to the emotions of the Chinese people with nationalism. Uh, and he also, I think, has done what he can to restore um, the kind of Communist Party's sort of moral mandate, as it were, its, its position. I think before then there was a lot of corruption and Xi Jinping has at least addressed the um, most, most serious issues um, and he's made the perception of the party being, you know, kind of more efficient and cleaner, strong, even if the reality is still um, somewhat distant from that. So, you know, he is now a very, very significant central figure in Chinese politics, the most important and the most central. And there are questions about whether he's ever going to be able to, dis you know, can he ever kind of re retire from this because he's, you know, so central to everything. Is he always, is he going to be there forever? And in 2018, the, the constitution was modified to accommodate for Xi Jinping thought. Now, what are the key tenets of that? Well, um, <laughs> Xi Jinping thought um, is a kind of, I suppose what you'd say the most important aspect of it is it's comprehensive. It's about reform and being comprehensive. So it was really an attempt to knit together ideas about, you know, creating a um, more ecological society, a more urbanized society, having a better balanced economy where there was, you know, a mixture of agriculture, services, manufacturing, um, a sort of push back against this idea of China simply being, you know, the kind of factory for the world. Uh, you know, the idea of China being a place of middle class consumption. Um, and also a China which uh, has the sort of um, aspirations to be a um, strong, rich country. I mean, th this isn't a new thing. I mean, the idea of China being a strong, rich country. Uh, that language goes back to the 18th or 19th century, you know, the very birth of modernity in China. Um, but now it's real. You know, the idea is that it's, it's actually real. Um, that China is now um, standing on the cusp of this moment of renaissance. And so, you know, Xi Jinping thought, though it's conveyed in all this sort of fairly technical language, at heart, I think, is a sort of, nationalistic you know kind of message um its significance is is really just the fact that it's called thought um you know previous leaders deng xiaoping had deng xiaoping theory uh jiang zeming had the sort of this idea of the three represents um but it wasn't called thought it was um something you know less um formal hu jintao had um you know, kind of the um, uh, you know, kind of um, the the concept of scientific development, but actually the only previous leader who had a kind of thought system was Mao Zedong. You know, the Mao Zedong Sushia, Mao Zedong thought. So for Xi Jinping to sort of talk about Xi Jinping thought and put it in the constitution seemed to be a deliberate 
you know, echo of Mao and a, a sort of appeal, you know, that he was, in a sense, the new Mao. Um, I mean, the only thing you can say about that, though, is that the Mao of, uh, you know, the China of Mao Zedong, it was nothing like the China of today in terms of its power, size, the size of its economy. Um, so, you know, the parallels can only go so far. And in 2013, he starts using the phrase, the China dream. Now, what do we mean by that? Yeah, I think this was sort of an attempt to correct the somewhat technocratic and uninspiring language of his predecessor, uh, uh, Hu Jintao, who, who was the sort of archetypal sort of technocrat, spoke a language of, of statistics and, and, you know, it wasn't very engaging, never really talked much about his own life. I think Xi Jinping has uh, uh, kind of adopted a much more personal uh, tone and he's much more of a kind of uh, giver of speeches. Um, he speaks in a standard Beijing dialect. I, I think Hu Jintao had a slight accent uh, from his native, well, I mean, he had been born in Anhui, maybe or Shanghai. Um, so it wasn't sort of, to you know, it wasn't totally standard. Um, so the China dream, I think, is really an attempt to use a more emotional language and basically say, well, now China is rich enough to have some aspirations and dreams and to sort of desire to be, you know, in a different kind of role in the world. And, um, you know, this is this is sort of really, you know, kind of useful for the propaganda and, and the messaging. It shows that, you know, China is not just about grinding out GDP growth, but also about having ideals like everyone else and, you know, kind of having aspirations and uh, that those are not just for Chinese people. The way that the China dream has been presented is also that they are ones that can be shared. Um, the criticism really is, of course, it's also abstract and also kind of generic that no one really knows what it means and everyone has their own definition. Uh, so once you move to the detail, the China dream can rapidly fragment and uh, sometimes totally disintegrate. But I think, um, it's also slightly echoing uh, or, or mimicking the American dream. You know, a lot of what China does in a very strange way seems to almost want to emulate, uh, you know, kind of America. And it seems like the more China wants to emulate and echo America, the more America sort of doesn't like it. So, so you know, it's a strange sort of thing that China's using this borrowed language and hasn't really created its own sort of uh, way of speaking about what it wants. Can you give us some background uh, into the Belt and Road Initiative and what the geopolitical significance of it is? Yeah, so one of the criticisms in the Hu Jintao era from 2002 to 2012 was that China was too silent. You know, it was this big power that didn't really say what it wanted. And so with Xi Jinping, there's been a definite push to talk a bit more about, you know, what is China? What is its sort of plans? What does it want from you know, its newfound economic wealth and also its new role in the world. And so the, uh, you know, the Belt and Road in Initiative, it, it really grows from that. It's sort of China for the first time in modern history, really, spelling out what its global vision is, what is its vision beyond its borders. I mean, it's not easy because lots and lots of people don't want a country with a one-party system to have the power that China has. And so were it to get too ambitious and start setting down, you know, a new global order, immediately there would have been a problem. Um, so what it's really constructed is this idea of a kind of common uh, space, you, you know, kind of built on um, economic issues uh, and mutual material benefits. So uh, China's been really kind of pushing this idea from really from 2013, but the Belt and Road formally started to exist really from the year year later. Um, and so it's got many dimensions. There's no map of the Belt and Road. I mean, you know, the kind of um, the, the, you know, the maritime road and the, and the kind of uh, the land belt, these are sort of uh, going all over, you know, they can in theory come deep into Europe. Even, even the UK thinks it's on the Belt and Road. Um, but I mean, principally, um, it, it's really about China's role in the Asia Pacific region, about China using, you know, its ability to build infrastructure and its economic wealth to try and, you know, create joint corporations with neighbours around it. Um, it's been most sort of embraced by countries like Pakistan, that in any case were pretty friendly towards China, the, the countries in um, Central uh, Asia. 
um, you know, Kazakhstan, places like that, and, and Russia up to a point, and the Middle East. Um, it's been most problematic, I suppose, to countries like India or Australia, where they kind of feel like they're being pulled into this idea, and yet they don't even know what, don't really know what it involves or what it is. It's an idea that has been criticised a lot because of debt trap diplomacy, you know, kind of building these projects and then not really allowing the countries, host countries, uh, to, to be able to kind of service the debt from them. It creates all sorts of issues. There's been a case in Sri Lanka, a quite well-known case of a port in Sri Lanka that in the end got handed back to China. Um, and also about the heavy use of Chinese labour uh, rather than local labour. However, you know, China needs to have a global role. It would be very strange for the world's second biggest economy not to have that global role. Uh, and so the Belt and Road is an attempt to try and spell that out. It will not go away because it's now written into the uh, constitution, the Chinese constitution, the state constitution. Um, it, it's not going to disappear. However, um, certainly because of COVID-19, it's become a little less prominent than it was. But maybe that's just going to change next, next year. And in recent years, of course, we've seen the deterioration of US and China relations and Secretary of State Pompeo's speech in July was a, almost a declaration of war, I suppose. Um, now, what's driving this, this, this tension, do you think? Well, I mean, lots of things. Um, America, I think, you know, until recently believed that the, the sort of right approach to China was engagement where, you know, economically you would work with the country but but in the end there will be political change you know that was sort of classic modernization theory i guess you know latin america and all sorts of other places um a certain level of economic growth china uh, you know countries democratized or at least reformed um but china seems to want to kind of really change this template um you know it's now got a per capita gdp around about the kind of levels where you, elsewhere you would see political change um but this it's not happened it's not happened so far and, and as of today it doesn't look likely to happen I mean, it, it, that's not to say that it won't but but it doesn't look very likely at the moment not anytime soon so i think america is sort of feeling like a, a long patient uh engagement with china didn't really lead to anywhere that looked good I think also it's frustrated because it feels a lot of the economic goods have gone to China, not really come, you know, being shared with others, particularly the United States. I think that's Trump's particular issue, you know, that there's big trade imbalances and it's like all the manufacturing has cleared off from America and created a lot of unemployment. Um, and also a, a sort of sense that China hasn't really played fair. That's the claim. I'm not saying that's right. But that's the claim. Um, all of this has been, I suppose, antagonized by things that maybe aren't really China's fault. One is, you know, the serious divisions within the United States um, and the sort of polarization of opinion there. So that, that China has been sucked into that. And it's one of the few areas where people tend to agree. So everyone's got a very hard line on China because it's a sort of source of unity, ironically. Um, and I guess the sort of final thing is, you know, the kind of uh, fact, the brute fact, I suppose, that China has economically been so successful, particularly in the last 20 years. And I don't think anyone thought that it would be able to maintain its political system pretty much um, without major compromise and yet be in pole position to become the world's biggest economy in the next five to 10 years. This is a staggering achievement and it, it, it's something that there's been no roadmap for this. Um, you know, because to be honest, this this means that you know the world's greatest practitioner of capitalism is going to be a communist country, which is quite an extraordinary outcome. Do you think it's accurate to call it a, a new Cold War, or do you think that's fundamentally misleading? Well, it stretches the sort of meaning of Cold War quite a long way. I mean, I know people like to sort of make links with things that happened before, but I think there's more that's sort of different now than is the same during the Cold War. I mean, I don't think China is like the USSR and sort of trying to proselytize, you know, its value system and its political system to the world around it. 
um, I think it regards its political system as unique to itself. It's, it's fairly kind of exceptionalist in its view of itself. Um, I think also there's no way that the USSR was even as um, vaguely as interlinked with the global finance and supply chain and technological system as China is. I mean, you know, the divisions between the USSR and the world outside in the 50s, 60s and 70s were pretty neat. You know, there were boundaries and, you know, one side of it, you were in one territory and the other, you were in the other. And, and that went across everything from trade to, you know, territory to kind of, you know, politics. Whereas the problem is that China just doesn't operate like that. It's much more amorphous. Um, it's active in virtual space, you know, in ways that didn't even apply in the 1950s and 60s. So I think, you know, the Cold War gives this neatness to a situation which is actually really not that neat. Um, you know, this is, this is the big problem that, you know, China is partly a partner and partly definitely not. Um, it's constantly ambiguous and, well, I mean, you know, as, as Europeans and Americans, we don't really like ambiguity. We like clarity and, you know, we, we don't really want to live with this sort of constant doubt and so, sort of second guessing. I mean, I think the thing that I wrestle with, uh, to, to be honest, with China is, you know, on the one hand, it's certainly um, a place where in the last 50 to 60 years, you know, the material lives and well-being of Chinese people have overwhelmingly improved. Uh, and every kind of metric that you come across proves this, you know, in terms of life expectancy and literacy and, you know, kind of nutrition and wealth levels and education. I mean, everything you look at, you know, the reason why, although people don't usually ex sort of know this um statistically the world is now um wealthier and better off and healthier than it's ever been before despite you know what's happening at the moment is because of india and china and the vast number of people that have improved their lifestyle um in those two countries you know you know poverty levels have, have really collapsed china you know this year says it will have eliminated you know absolute poverty and uh, no reason to believe they have, they haven't. I mean, I think that's true. But on the other hand, there's also, you know, shattering examples of, uh, you know, the maltreatment of minorities or marginalized groups or, or you know, kind of groups that are regarded as being dis, um, you know, kind of uh, dis, you know, disloyal. Um, so the, you know, the Communist Party certainly has prom promulgated and, and pros prosecuted a you know, f horrendous campaign in Xin Xinjiang, uh, the Uyghur, uh, you know, kind of uh, minority area. Um, many Uyghurs um, are Muslims uh, and, and practice, you know, kind of a different sort of value system. Uh, Hong Kong, uh, obviously with the national security law that was passed in uh, the July. Um, I mean, you know, it's a hard thing to sort of, on the one hand, look at almost the sort of daily news of China's being a problem, you, you know, I mean, every day there are things that prove that, um, you know, only today, China's foreign minister Wang Yi in Germany, you know, on a visit made fairly aggressive remarks about, you know, the Czech Republic having a kind of visit to Taiwan and, you know, kind of in, in ways that it's sort of dismaying to hear. Um, on the other hand, one can't dismiss the vast achievement that China has made, you know, for the vast, you know, many, many people in the country. Um, even if you say that this is their achievement, well, it's their achievement under the Communist Party. I mean, that's just a fact. Even if the Communist Party can't take all the credit, nor should it not be given any credit at all. I mean, there must be something it's done to help these people, even if it's let them just do what they're doing. Uh, and that's more than lots of governments do, right? So, so... I, I think this is why, you know, it's uh, such a hugely difficult issue to think through because it totally splits, you know, kind of our usual judgments. This is not, you know, people like saying, oh, you know, the Communist Party of China is the Nazi party of the current day. But, well, you know, that's sort of stretching it to a level of absoluteness, which I think is, is you know, the Communist Party of China does not subscribe to, you know, the kind of racial theories um, that the Nazi Party did, and the Communist Party certainly 
uh, is not undertaking the kinds of campaigns uh, or really the kinds of aggression that the Nazi party led to. I mean, you know, and so, so these parallels are, are often, you know, not, not helpful. The thing that you can say is that China's now in a, you know, kind of very, very ambiguous position that, you know, it's not good, it's not bad, it's sort of constantly creating complexity that, that is very, very difficult for, I think, a public uh, or publics in Europe and America that really have never had to think about China before to, to try and sort of manage. And um, this issue, I don't think is going to go away. So it's good that your sort of work is trying to promote a bit more understanding of it and that you're engaging with that because I think people will have to do that. It's, it, this issue is not going to go away. A fifth of humanity is not going to vanish and nor should it vanish, nor do we have any right outside of China to say that it should vanish, but it's not going to also be an easy partner to deal with. Okay, appreciate you really busy, so I'll, I'll finish with this one. Do you think the, uh, the 21st century is going to be the Chinese century, or do you think we're dealing with a reluctant power here? Well, I could be both. <laughs> I mean, you can be a, China, a reluctant China century. I mean, maybe that's clearer. Maybe that's a bit um, clearer. Yeah, I mean, look, um, the indicators are, barring disaster, and that, of course disaster can happen, as... as We've all often seen, and um, but by disaster, um, you, know, you know, China will at some point in the next ten years or so, maybe sooner, be the world's biggest economy. So this is going to be a big, big symbolic moment, um, and and that really kind of creates all sorts of questions about well, what what sort of world is that going to be? Because China is going to just by the fact it's got this huge economy, uh, be you know very prominent and very powerful. But I think there are many things that it is clear it doesn't want to get, you know, involved in. It doesn't want to do the things that America did. It doesn't want to have, you know, treaty alliances and commitments all over the place. It doesn't at the moment have, you know, military bases. I mean, I think it's got one in um, Djibouti on the east coast of Africa. I mean, America has over about 650. I mean, it doesn't want to spend vast sums of money going and sorting other people's security issues out. So, you know, it's going to be a century in which China's got this massive role, which is now emerging, but is still quite undefined, um, but in which it itself clearly does not want to be the new United States. Um, I, and I mean, I guess the final thing you can say is, you know, if even if China were, um, you know, to have the same political model as, uh, you know, Western democracies, um, it would still be a very tough moment. You know, these transitions from one power to another being economically and therefore geopolitically dominant, even when they share the same values, are not easy. I mean, the UK and the US did not have an easy transition um, uh, in the last century. Um, and so, you know, there's that, that, that just the process of transiting from one, you know, kind of dominant power to another is never easy. But the, this is made infinitely more difficult by the fact that it's, you know, a transition potentially from, you know, kind of one value system and one political viewpoint to one which is completely different. And so, you know, that makes it clear that this was never going to be an easy process. So I think some of China's reluctance is from an acknowledgement that it was always going to be in a very difficult position. And in a difficult position, it certainly is. And uh, it, that's true for all of us.